Well, let's look at the Gospel of John tonight, and uh, as we read through these uh, verses, John chapter 4, let's highlight once again these uh, very, very important uh, principles on evangelism from the true Master, Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Beginning at verse 3 of chapter 4, He left Judea and went away into Galilee. He had to pass through Samaria. He came to a city of Samaria called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, being wearied from his journey, was sitting thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour, about 12 o'clock. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Therefore, the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it you being a Jew ask me for a drink since I'm a Samaritan woman? And then John adds this note, For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God, And who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Verse 11 of John chapter 4. She said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? You're not greater than our father Jacob, are you, who gave us the well and drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle? Jesus answered and said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst, but the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. I love that analogy. Verse 15, the woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty nor come all the way here to draw. Verse 16, he said to her, go call your husband and come here. Let me stop the reading at that point. I think just in those verses, those first 18 verses there, there are many, many principles on evangelism we can learn from the master, um, many more than we have time for. Let me begin by suggesting Uh, maybe the first two. The first one, if you recall, is Jesus took time to speak to individuals. Jesus took time to speak to a single precious soul. I don't believe anybody was ever busier than Jesus. I don't think Anyone has ever had more things to do, more places to go, more people to talk with than Jesus, and a very short window of opportunity to accomplish all of that, just about three years. And sometimes Jesus would speak to the multitudes, as we studied in Matthew 5, 6, and 7 in the Sermon on the Mount. But there are many occasions that Jesus would speak to an individual. He would take time out of an extremely busy schedule to talk to Nicodemus, John 3, a man at the pool of Bethesda, John 5, a man born blind, put out of the synagogue because he maintained a very sincere observation, remained completely honest in what he understood had happened to him. And then Luke 19, you've got Zacchaeus, an individual. Jesus spent a considerable amount of time with Zacchaeus, a tax collector. And here, of course, in John 4, with the Samaritan woman. Now, why would Jesus take time out of a very busy schedule instead of teaching the multitudes, as he sometimes did, teach an individual like this, a Samaritan woman, no less? Well, the answer, as you recall, was in Matthew 16 and verse 26. 
What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and yet loses his own soul? Now, we sell out to Satan oftentimes, or mankind does, for a whole lot less than that. Usually a quarter acre of ground and a truckload of lumber and a bag of nails. They call a house. But Jesus said, what will a man profit if he gains the whole world and yet loses his own soul? Jesus said, a soul, a single soul, which means your soul and my soul is worth more than the entire universe, everything it contains. He didn't say a city. He didn't say a state. He didn't say a continent. He said the whole world. One soul, your soul, is worth more than the whole world, and so is the soul of that person you work with and that person you see at the grocery store and you see at the restaurant who's waiting on you. And you see when you fill up with gas, those souls around you, those are precious souls, Jesus said, are worth more than the entire world. We need to learn from the master and get that concept of every single soul is precious and valuable. And so if, if not now, brother and sister, maybe six months from now, maybe a year from now, maybe two years from now, we're laying the groundwork, things we're saying and doing to lead to a Bible study. That's what we want, even if it's not now. I want to act in such a way toward you and my fellow man that when life changes, and you know it does change just like that, and it hands you some real curves, when life changes and they're now thinking more about spiritual things, that you'll be there to fill that spiritual emptiness that they're feeling and teach them the gospel of Jesus Christ. But uh, you work the soil of their heart in such a way that hopefully you can sow the seeds, if not now, later on. The individual, but we, know, we must move on here. The second one I want to suggest is Jesus made opportunities out of ordinary situations. Going to the well for water, it's an ordinary situation. It was a daily task for her and for Jesus. The text tells us he was wearied, traveled all morning in the hot Judean sun. It was now noontime. He stops to rest beside Jacob's well. Not too many things could be more ordinary than a man who's tired, thirsty, and would like a drink of water. Here comes this woman from Samaria to draw water. And Jesus turned that ordinary situation for both of them into an amazing opportunity to teach the gospel, teach the good news of salvation. As a result of that, not only this woman would be saved, but many, many other people in the city. So the application to me is, okay, stop waiting for spectacular things to happen or someone to approach me and ask for a Bible study or some kind of sign or indicator, that's not going to happen. Um, what I need to do is be like my master here, the Lord Jesus, and make opportunities out of daily situations. Adam spoke from Ephesians 5.16 recently and you know, redeemed the time. Time there in Greek is not chronos. It's a different Greek word. It's K-A-I-R-O-S. And it actually means season of opportunity. Redeem the opportunities. The Apostle Paul, led by the Holy Spirit, sees each day with an allotment of opportunities. Today's almost over. In this day, God gave you and I a number of opportunities. Did we take them? Well, here's one of them to be here, to assemble in fellowship to lift each other up, to equip one another, do work of service, to build up the body. He provided a spiritual support group. That's what the local church is, a support group spiritually. I, I'm glad you're here. I thank you for your support. It's a wise decision to come and to worship God together and build each other up. 
What about the other opportunities you had today? Every day has its opportunities. Ephesians 5.16, redeem the opportunities. But the days are evil. If we don't, Satan will take advantage and he'll try to lead us away from the Lord. But Jesus used every opportunity. And so when I go again to the gas station, I can take one of these maybe. And I can leave it on the pump. Or like Jared, where he was formerly living, he's moved, by the way, now he's in a different residence, um, much nicer residence. But where he was, he would take several of these each day and he'd put them on tables in the nearby area. Just whatever you can do. You know, we, we have different levels and ways to teach. This is something we can all do. We can leave one of these on a table and uh, offer a Bible study that way. Make opportunities out of ordinary situations. Uh, let's go a little further in uh, the example here. How about uh, this one? Have a spiritual goal. in mind. I have a spiritual goal. So I'm conversing with someone at the store and uh, maybe a neighbor, but the whole time I'm conversing, I'm thinking, just like Jesus, how can I turn this conversation into something spiritual? How can I bring this into the spiritual realm? They keep talking about the weather how can I turn that into something spiritual or their health or their yard, what have you? Jesus asked for a drink of water because he was genuinely thirsty. And then he turned that into a conversation about living water from which if you drink, you never thirst again. And so what you see is he's thinking spiritual all the time. He's thinking of her soul. Her soul is more important than him drinking that water. Her having living water is more important than him having a meal. And that's, that's part of evangelism. You're willing to sacrifice time, meal, even a drink of water, if it means an opportunity here. And so he, he, he's thinking ahead. He's looking beyond the acorn to the oak tree. He's looking beyond the horizon of the mundane, way off into eternity. How can I lead this soul? to the Lord, or to God. How can I lead this soul to God? And so when, when we're talking to people, here's another lesson we can learn from Jesus. I'm always thinking about, or I should be, I, I'm not always, I fail. But I should be thinking about in this conversation, how can I steer it toward heaven, toward the Bible, toward a Bible study? That would be the really a wonderful thing, a Bible study, uh, because that's what Jesus did. Um, here's a fourth lesson I learned from Jesus here, and that is the simplicity with which he spoke to people. Jesus was the smartest, most intelligent, wisest man that ever lived. Every word in the human vocabulary is at his disposal. And yet, what kind of words did he use? He could have spoken in such a way that Einstein would have struggled to understand what he's saying. But, of course, John 4, he said, she understands water. I'm going to talk to her about living water. In John 10, in an audience there that understood shepherds and, and sheep, he talked about being the good shepherd. And uh, not being someone who's just a hireling. It runs away, first sign of trouble. But uh, he talks about sheep and how they are not to be driven. They follow the shepherd. You don't drive sheep. You lead sheep. Um, but these are the kind of terms Jesus uses. To those who understood farming, he said, the sower goes forth to sow. Some falls in this kind of ground, some that kind of ground. We definitely need, to, I need to take a lesson there. And I need to make sure I'm adapting my approach to this person, wherever they are. Uh, I need to start where they are. 
And that's true in a lot of different ways. Um, let's see, one other, I wanna, I'm trying to hurry through these because I wanna get to that other study and yet do them justice as well. Jesus had the every creature concept here, the every creature. He was sent to the family of Israel. He'll say that. I was sent to the house of Israel. God is finishing his relationship with the Jewish people, as he said he would. Although he gives them another 40 years, they go to the synagogues first to, to learn the truth, to come and accept the king that God has sent. But he sent to the household of Israel, but little by little, what's he doing here in John 4? He's breaking down those barriers, those walls that exist between Jews and other nationalities. Here's a Samaritan. Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. They certainly wouldn't eat with them. Now, they'll conduct business, but they wouldn't have a meal with them. Well, Jesus is not only talking to Samaritan, it's a Samaritan woman. And so tearing down those walls so the disciples would eventually see every creature is a prospect for the gospel. Don't write people. I, I need to make sure I don't write people off. I don't know their heart. We can't read minds. Only God can read hearts and minds. That's, that's a reason, by the way, brother and sister, and I, I say this whenever I can, because nothing makes a human being angry, more angry quicker than someone trying to judge their motives. It's not our place. No man knows the spirit of the man, save the spirit within him, 1 Corinthians 2. But uh, Jesus, Jesus knew her heart that it could be open and receptive because he's God to the truth. He knew about her life because he's God. That's not something we can know. We can only know by the fruit. We know them by the fruit. That's our place. Look at the fruit. We're not the judge. We're just the fruit inspector. So we look at the fruit, and based on the word of God, we have to make an assessment, assessment and we do that daily. Uh, hopefully it's righteous judgment. But uh, every creature have the every creature concept. And eventually, you know, Jesus is going to say, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. I'm sorry, but you need professional help to misunderstand that statement. And that's what people get every day. And so let's teach them the simple gospel plan. The gospel of Jesus is good news. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. We need to get that message out. Um, two other things here. One, uh, hope. Give people hope. I say a lot about this, but I don't think I can say enough about it, even to remind myself, is no matter what their situation may be, give them hope. How many husbands has this woman had, based on the text? How many husbands? Five. Does Jesus know that? Of course he does. He's going to say that in just a moment. And yet he doesn't talk about that. What does he talk about first? Living water. I have living water from which if you drink, you know, first begin. And what is her response to that living water? I want that kind of water. He gave her hope. Now, no person has ever been saved who has not first been convicted of sin. There has to be a conviction of sin. And so with that hope, with that, you know, realistic goal in view, that that can be yours, living water, then Jesus said, go call your husband, knowing the situation. But first of all, you know, she's going to have to change, make a lot of changes in her life, major changes. It's going to be a major upheaval in her life. Now, who's going to do that unless they have sufficient incentive? You're not. I'm not. We need plenty of incentive to do that. That's where the hope comes in. Show them the hope that they can have, that that forgiveness and that death that Jesus died and the grace and the atonement he offers is just as much 
yours to claim as it is mine. Offer that hope. But it's, at some point, there has to be a conviction of sin. So Jesus said, go call your husband. I have no husband. Jesus said, you're honest. You're honest. You're right. Man, you're living with is not your husband. You've had five. And he says, you have rightly said. He says it two times. He's impressed with her honesty. You got to be honest if you're going to learn the truth. So uh, those, those thoughts, especially I gain from John chapter four. Now, does anyone have another observation before we leave it for a while? It's going to be a while, maybe before we get back to it, that you'd like to bring out in the evangelism class, evangelism classes from John chapter four. Anyone else have something they want to bring out from this chapter? Anything else you see there? Okay, if not, let's use the remainder of our time to go over the sheet. Uh, next week, it will be the kingdom study, but uh, Right now, look at these, the sheet, Practical Suggestions for Effective Evangelism. For those who are ready to get a class started, maybe you have a class going on right now. Let's go over some of these uh, suggestions. Begin the class with prayer. Beginning the class is, is the uh, topic. Okay, so you're, you're, you're in the class. Start it with prayer. Ask God's blessing, his grace upon your efforts there. We risk the success of every Bible study by not laying it before the throne of God. Number two, as a rule, one class per week, one hour per class. That can certainly vary depending on their schedule and circumstances. But as a rule, one class per week and one hour per class. Um, sometimes it might go over, but th this seems to have worked very well for me, at least. Uh, number three, as a rule, do not call to confirm the study. Unless, of course, they live 100 miles away. And you don't want to drive 100 miles and they're not there, of course. Or they've, of course, asked if you would call and confirm, then call and confirm. But if they have agreed to Tuesday night, at 7 p.m., you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to show up at 7 p.m. on Tuesday night. Now, I've gone, and people forgot about the class. But sometimes they'll say, let's go ahead and have it. Let's go ahead and have it because you're here. Or if they say, you know, I forgot all about it. I've got this or that to do. Can we do it next week? Yes, let's do it next week. Or how about Thursday? Do you have Thursday evening open? Hopefully they'll feel bad enough. They definitely won't miss it next week. But I'm going to be there. They have agreed to the study. I'm going to assume they're honest. They will keep their word, and I'm going to show up. The majority of the time I have found that if I call to confirm that study after they've agreed to the study, you know what? They'll find a way out. Oh, yeah, the study. Yeah, I got a bone in my leg tonight. I just don't think I can have it. You know, I, I've got this or that to do. They'll just find a way out of it. I've gone and and uh, in fact, to studies where the husband, in this case, set it up, the wife was home. And I said, okay, that's fine. I said, how about next week? Uh, let's, let's do it this time next week. And how about you be a part of the study? She said, well, I'll think about it. So I come the next week, same time. She is there. She is part of the study. And she became a Christian before he did. How about that? She became a Christian before he did. You may, I, you probably remember that, Dina, that it was the grace of God there. And, uh, but as a rule, um, just show up at the time they agreed. Uh, four, arrive a few minutes early. Never 
Never be late. We're all late sometimes, me included, for one reason or another, but uh, try to never be late. Uh, five, greet the students by name. We all like to hear our name, don't we? Greet the students by name. A small amount of friendly conversation is, of course, appropriate, but you should begin the study as soon as possible. They know why you're there. Get to it. You're limited on time and opportunity. Now, sometimes the television, the radio may be on. Maybe there's music playing. You can't have a class with that going on. It's far too distracting. People sometimes leave a TV on or radio just for company. It, it just background noise. And uh, I understand that. But when you begin the Bible study, you need to be able to focus entirely upon the word of God. And so you'll need to ask them, to, can I please or can you please turn that off? And usually I'll say, I'd rather hear you, Mr. Jones, than I would that radio. But I've never had somebody say, no, I like it on. Let's go ahead. I've never had anybody say that. Um, some pets may need to be restrained. Nobody likes your pets like you like your pets. I love dogs. In fact, dogs are my favorite animal. But I don't like your dogs like you like your dogs. <laughs> I, I remember a study Dean and I had with uh, Karen and Bob Denton years ago, Dina, and uh, they had this little, little dog, little miniature dog of some kind, and it would just nip at your heels. It didn't bother me as much as, much as it nipped at Dina's heels. I mean, we'd come in the door, rap, 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 you know, and it'd nip at her heels. We'd sit down, it'd calm down. And then after the study, as soon as we stood up, yap, 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 they started nipping at her heels again. So that went on a couple of times until I'd had enough of that. And the, and the owners thought it was cute. They were oblivious to it. And so when they, I waited, and when they weren't looking, I gave that dog a good swift kick in the nose. It went back about 12 inches. Yeah. And it never bothered us again. You can't have those kind of things going on in the Bible study. Sometimes dogs will just bark continuously. And you, you may have to ask, can we, can we please put the dog away somewhere? Maybe it's a cat. I had a study some one time where the cat jumped up on the table where we're studying. And the owner thought it was, again, amusing. I didn't think it was amusing. And the person who had come with me in that study was very allergic to cats. It's not Dina. She's allergic to cats, but it's, it was somebody else. And uh, Herb Payton, you've heard me talk about Herb. But uh, anyway, he, he, know, he knew there might be a cat, yet he came with me anyway. That's the kind of man he was. So he jumped on the table. And of course, Herb went like that, didn't say a word. I said, ma'am, can we maybe put that cat in a different room so we can study the word of God and not be interrupted? She said, oh, oh yeah, yeah, okay. So, as if that's a novel idea. Look, it seemed pretty obvious to me. But you can't have animals interrupting your study. It's precious time. You may not get another opportunity. But uh, things like that have to be dealt with. Uh, number eight, it's helpful to have a glass of water from the beginning. You'll need it for your voice. And people see that as an opportunity to serve you. It's a small thing, but it's still an opportunity to serve you. And so it's, it's, a, it's a positive thing both ways. It's a win-win. Nine, uh, you, you suggest the seating, preferably, preferably at the table. If it's a DVD format, make sure you can see your students. Um, it's been a long day, hard work, they're tired put a DVD in there, they may just drop off on you. So you may need to pause it and make a comment. You don't say, hey, wake up, you know, you pause it and make a comment or whatever you need to do uh, to get their attention going once again and then continue the study. Uh, number 10, except for the immediate family brothers, you never study with a woman alone. Even the best of intentions can go awry. You never study 
with a woman alone. Unless, of course, immediate family. Number 11, look for other things of interest to your students. Try to find common ground, family, work, pictures, music. You're trying to build a rapport here. This, this should be enjoyable. And uh, that certainly helps. Uh, 12, bring identical Bibles. We talked about that. At the beginning of the first class, ask your students. This is what I'll typically do unless I already know the answer. So, um, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, how much do you actually know about the Bible? You'd be amazed at how completely honest they will be with you. And in many cases, they will say, you know, I really don't know anything about the Bible. So there's your open door to begin by simply rehearsing. Okay, let's, let's talk about this. It looks like one volume, but really it's 66 books. Old and New Testament index, how to find the books, and then rehearse finding some of the passages. They've given you that open door, take it. And now you know also where to begin. Do you believe this is the word of God? Do you believe Jesus is the son of God? Do you believe that uh, it's the all-inspired word of God? And so those things need to be established from the beginning. Even though people say they, they respect this as the word of God, understand this. Um, the vast majority of the time, they do not respect it nearly as much as they need to. And neither do we in many cases. But, you know, some study on the subject of building respect for the Bible as the inspired word of God or studies will need to be done at some point. 99% of the time. Um, and there's a study like that in that notebook. Number um, 14, if a question is asked or topic suggested, which is not pertinent to the subject at hand, tell me about Armageddon. Tell me about the rapture. Can we study Revelation? You know, something which is totally off the subject. Um, thank them for the question. Answer it as briefly as possible using, of course, scripture. And maybe if you're able to suggest, can we look at that subject at the end of our study tonight. Can, can we go to the Bible and see what it has to say about that at the end of our study tonight? Yeah, you, and usually they're fine with that. Um, if you don't know the answer, obviously I don't know, but I need, I'll search that and next week, let's, you search it as well. We'll see what the Bible has to say about that. That's a Bible question. It needs a Bible answer. And so I need to find out where, where that's taught in the Bible. Or not talk. Sometimes it's a topic that's going to be covered anyway in your studies, and you can say, well, in uh, fourth or fifth study, you know, we're going to actually look at that topic, focus on that topic. Can we wait till then? Until then, here's a few passages to look at. Um, number 15, always schedule the next week's study. Don't leave the house or the building, wherever you are, until you set up the next week's Bible study. So is Tuesday going to work out next week as well? How about 7 o'clock? Would you like it earlier or later? No, this seems to be a good time. Okay, then I'll be here uh, for the Bible study. And, of course, end each study with a word of prayer. Anybody have any questions on any of these things right here, these practical suggestions on Bible study? Anybody? Any comments? These are things that I found have worked well through the years, but I'm sure you have a number of good things you could add to this. Anybody? Okay, well, um, the other side of that sheet, remember this study we did on the charts, okay? And the main thing here is we need to get specific. I need to stay specific. Dempsey, who are you going to approach about a Bible study this week? Not somebody. Who is, who is that person? Where do they live? What information can you get ahead of time that would help your approach? So get specific in, in, uh, about personal evangelism. 
I, I like to write the names out. I have a list of people and I, I go through that list and then I renew the list. So keep it current. Somebody is nobody. Someday is not on the calendar. And um, so stay specific and of course, pray about that situation. And, and this chart also suggests, you know, working with people you know and who know you, visitors in the assembly, occasional service associations, and then, of course, the last, uh, the last thing there is seeking to make opportunities in more difficult situations, but it's another opportunity. Lord willing, in the fall, those who would like to will try to set up a time and we can do some door-to-door -door work. And if you feel uncomfortable knocking on the door, then just leaving it in the door. Um, there have been a number of people through the years led to the Lord beginning that way. It still has a, has a purpose and usefulness. And that's one of several ways, several ways that we want to incorporate eventually into getting prospects for the gospel. Okay. So with that, we're going to, we're going to end our study on evangelism and uh, Lord willing, get back into the gospel of the kingdom and, and its king next week. And, in Matthew. So please be studying the Gospel of Matthew. Remember, we left off at chapter 8, Matthew chapter 8. Thank you very much for your attention tonight. I love to study the Bible with people who love to study the Bible. Thank you so much.